Welcome to the Wharton Global Youth Meetup Live Alumni Career Chat. I'm Diana Drake, Managing Editor with the Wharton Global Youth Program. As part of our ongoing series of conversations with Wharton graduates this summer, today we're going to learn more about the Unscripted Project, which uses the power of improv training to better prepare students for personal and professional success. In April 2020, the Unscripted Project won the President's Engagement Prize at Penn, which awards $100,000 to fund post-graduation projects and a $50,000 living stipend for each student. I'm excited to welcome Unscripted co-founders Mira Menon and Philip Chen to Career Chat. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us, Diana. Thanks for having us. So first, some brief bios. Mira grew up in the Bay Area in California and graduated from Wharton with a degree in Management, Finance, and International Development. A longtime performer, she attributes many of her business strengths, like speaking with confidence and building relationships, to her theater and improv training. Philip, who hails from Melbourne, Australia, graduated from Wharton with a degree in finance, real estate, and cinema studies. He, too, is a lifetime lover of the performing arts and believes passionately in their transformative powers. All right, guys, I have so many questions, which actually reminds me, Please post your questions in the Q&A at any time, and we will be answering them in the second half of our conversation. That's directed at our wonderful audience today. So before we get into the specifics of, um, of the Unscripted Project, can you tell me exactly what improv is? Just give us a baseline definition. Yeah, well, improv is for us uh, a type of theater where everything is unscripted, hence the unscripted project. It's where a group of people come together and create something from nothing. And that is the beauty of improv. It's being spontaneous. It's yes, ending each other's ideas and creating a magical story from the simplest of catalysts. Excellent. So, Philip, as long as you defined for us, I'm going to start with you. So I believe you guys met as freshmen at Wharton, right? Can you tell us that story? And also, can you tell us at what point you started thinking about the impact of improv on the lives of students? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, me and Mira met before even our first day. It was orientation for incoming Wharton students. And we were in the same cohort, in the same class. And when we were freshmen, our kind of welcome activity was an amazing race around the entire school. And we were just randomly put in the same group. So we've been friends since the beginning of our time in college. And we really bonded over our shared passions of social impact. And in junior year, we realized both of us were doing plays at the same time, which is very unique for um, Warden students, I guess. Um, so that's where we really put our heads together and thought, you know, we could do something about this because we realized those were the commonalities that we had that we thought made us really successful. So, Mira, we need to understand the Unscripted Project a little bit better. So, from what I understand, it's designed to run 10-week improv courses for students in grades 6 through 10 in Philadelphia public schools. So can you tell us more about the business model and also how you have been spending your past year since winning the engagement prize? You guys must be so busy with this. And what a year it's been, right? It's been unique and so crazy and challenging. So I, I want to know also maybe how the pandemic has impacted your work. Yeah, absolutely. This year has been nothing short of incredible, <laughs> I really would say. Um, I think that there's nothing from kind of a personal level to start with. I think there's nothing as rewarding as creating something and building something that you believe in so strongly from scratch. Uh, I think it is an incredible learning experience where you're forced to <laughs> challenge to maybe uh, really dive into all aspects of running an organization um, and really running a business. So we learned so much about how we hire folks. Like how do you actually, what needs to be included in a job application? to all the way to when you have two final applicants and you've met them both and they're incredible, what do you prioritize? Uh, how do you extend that offer and how do you make sure that they're really excited about joining your company, really your organization? That's a top of mind sort of example. Um, but going back a little bit, the core of what Unscripted does, Diana, is you're exactly right. We run 10 week, this year it's been all online, improv classes in schools during the school day. 
And so what it looks like is that we have a team of five teaching artists who are expert improvisers, honestly much stronger than me or Philip, um, who have experience in the classroom and as educators. And so we have a curriculum. Each week is centered on a specific life skill. And the class goes with you have a bunch of improv exercises that you do, and then you reflect back on, OK, what are these connections between the improv exercises and the real life skills? So an example of a game that we really like, or at least it's my favorite game, is gibberish job interview. And so how it go the, the purpose of the game is, you know, how can I practice the skills that I would need in a real job interview, but in the most low stakes, most fun way possible? Uh, and one answer to that is by doing the entire thing in gibberish, right? So you're still practicing the skills of how are you a compelling speaker? How are you sort of modulating your tone of voice to show that you're interested in things? Um, how are you what are you doing with your body language uh, to come across in a specific way uh, but you're doing it in gibberish so everyone's laughing and it's very chill uh, so that those are kind of an example of how the games go you also asked about business models diana uh, so we were really lucky to get this huge seed grant from penn it is honestly i think and Philip will agree with me, by the end of the year, we realized how rare that kind of seed funding at that scale is. Usually nonprofits are started um, by people who have the means to self-fund it. Philip and I at this point do not have the means to self-fund our nonprofit. Um, and so it was really cool that we were able to start this. Um, so we have that seed funding um, and we've applied to a bunch of foundations for grant funding um, to continue our program beyond this first year. Uh, and we've also launched corporate workshops so we run the same exact program or similar versions of it for any organization that is not a school, a public school in Philadelphia. And the idea is any proceeds that we make from those actually directly fund our nonprofit. So this is actually kind of a version of that. Just by being here, you guys are actually supporting our free in school programs in Philly. Uh, I think I covered all of the main points, Diana. Uh, Philip, do yeah. I Sorry to throw three questions at you at once, but I think the other question was just, you know, the challenge of the pandemic and and what that has meant. I mean, we've all pivoted that word if we have to use that word one more time. But, you know, I'm curious as to, you know, how you've had to kind of change up the way you were planning on doing it other than bringing things online. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah, I can take that. Um, I would say um, since the name of our program is really about teaching kids how to improvise this year is us proving that we can improvise as organization and adapt our offering to best suit the needs of our stakeholders which is with these kids uh, it was definitely a challenge thinking about how can we translate all of our work online but we have really incredible partners we work with to create our curriculum so we partnered with Philly Improv Theatre, we get a lot of lights from the Magnet Theatre in New York City and have mentors at Second City in Chicago, or big, great improv theatres across the country who, um, as theatres themselves, um, operated virtually this entire year. So we got a lot of advice about how to translate the materials we had to the virtual environment. And then we really listened to our teachers and school partners who told us, we need you more than ever before. Our kids are not showing up to school. Um, online learning is not interesting or compelling. Um, anything you can do to create any sort of virtual learning environment where kids can be creative again, can laugh, can form bonds, super important. So that was the challenge we took on and we just made sure that we could create a virtual experience that at the very least was something that they look forward to each day. Yeah, I mean, that's very true. So you actually, the demand for what you do went up, so to speak, because really, you know, there were so many challenges with being always on Zoom this, this year. Um, so, Philip, let me ask you this. Um, you were quoted in Penn today as saying everything we've learned to this point in terms of our theater experience has translated to success in the real world. So can you talk a little bit more about um, how improv is so powerful for building skills like communication and collaboration and resilience? You know, what is it about improv that has that secret sauce? Yeah, um, what I love most about improv is the spontaneity aspect of it. There is no script, there is no costumes, you just come as you are and you have to make it up on the spot. And to us, that is such an important skill. I think a lot of us, especially when I was in high school or some of you guys watching, I'm sure a lot of, um, we've been practicing how to write a speech and give a speech our entire lives. But 
when it comes to these higher stakes situations, like a job interview, sometimes there are curveballs. Um, and what we learn in improv is that you, you, you're you almost trained to be just ready for the unexpected, to be in the moment and react to whatever happens in front of you. And that is the whole joy of improv. And what I also love about improv is it's definitely a team exercise. Um, you can come up with an idea, but it's up to your teammates to yes and you, um, which is really about accepting your idea and building on top of it and working together in that supportive environment to take risks and create stories. Um, so to us, improv is not just the, the tools itself, but that learning environment um, in which you're allowed to take risks, you're allowed to work together, you're allowed to make mistakes and turn them to something beautiful. And all those are really important kind of skill sets that um, aren't as emphasized in school anymore, especially given how high stakes everything is these days. I think we just need an opportunity to be creative, an opportunity to work together, an opportunity to be ourselves. Yeah, and actually that I have a quote very similar to what you just said that Mira has said before, which is nothing is a mistake in improv. It's more like a gift and you get to decide what you want to do with that gift. And I just thought that was such a elegant way of saying it. Mira, can you expand on that a little bit? And also, can you give us an example of um, kind of the unscripted project in action? You did talk a little bit about this at the beginning when you were introducing the concept, but I'm wondering, you know, if you have a student that you're thinking about or you know, somebody that maybe lit up about um, using improv, because for me, it seems it's also getting out of that comfort zone. And that's what's so powerful about improv. So. What what are your thoughts on that in terms yeah. of your quote, but also, you know, what you've been up to this past year working with students? Yeah, 100 uh, percent. I think that mistakes piece is really important. I know that personally uh, growing up, I was definitely someone who tended towards being a perfectionist. Um, I think a lot of theater, you have a script that you memorize and there are certain things, certain beats that you hit and certain character things that you want to emphasize in a specific way. I also did debate growing up. Uh, again, I think those are all activities that really tend towards um, perfectionism. And so whenever I made a mistake, I personally would always like really get down on myself um, and not be happy with this mistake. And it became a thing that was much bigger and much more magnified than it honestly needed to be. Um, and so I think being introduced to improv was very refreshing to me because I saw that mistakes are not seen as like a failure on your part at all because of the team structure. So if Philip and I are playing an improv game um, and I give him a premise that is something that he's never expected. So for example, we're talking about a job interview in that same example. And I say, actually like you're interviewing uh, for the role of a plant whisperer. Uh, and maybe in actuality, we were supposed to do something like, I don't know, a chicken nugget scientist or something, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, I know that Philip is going to support me in that choice and we're going to use that to build upon the scene rather than saying, hey Mira, that was wrong. Why would you say something like that? Uh, and I think that's a really powerful reframing because I think in a lot of aspects of our, of our lives, if we can take the mistakes that we make and use them as opportunities for growth uh, rather than as reasons why we did not succeed, that can be a really powerful shift of mindset. Um, and improv just creates an environment that is very conducive to that. So I think I learned that skill and I continue to learn the skill. I think I learned that skill in improv, um, but have been able to apply it to many other areas of my life. Uh, in terms of what we've seen in students and in the classroom, uh, there are a couple examples uh, that come to mind of, wow, like students really got it. Um, there, I think there's a certain freedom that comes with knowing that what you say will be accepted um, and mistakes will be treated as gifts. So one of our students um, is a middle schooler. And I saw this question around the chat about uh, like how old do we like, or, like what is your favorite grade? I personally love middle schoolers. Um, and so one of the middle schoolers that we worked with um, was suffering from a stutter. So whenever we would ask her kind of like, hey, can you introduce yourself to the class at the top of class? Can you tell us just sort of like, you know, how can you answer this specific question? Like she would really struggle with a stutter. Um, but the moment that we asked her to improvise something or just to create a world 
uh, of her own, she would just, you know, she literally pulled up like a pen or a water bottle or something and talked about how this was her microphone and she was a singer and the stutter was gone. Like it, the words just were so like flowing so smoothly um, and she was getting so excited and you could hear the passion in her voice. Uh, and I think there, and honestly, I don't know enough about stutters or anything really to give you a clear explanation of why that was the case. Um, but it was really powerful to see that that freedom translated into her pattern of speech. Oh, yeah, that's definitely a wonderful example. Yeah. Have you, has there been a learning curve educating people about kind of this intersection of arts and business and the viability of the project? I mean, it is, you know, it is bringing the arts into a traditional business framework, so to speak. And I'm just curious if you've had to educate people about that. Yeah, I think on multiple fronts, um, it's not just educating others, but also making educating ourselves to know that this is a framework that makes sense and is viable. I think for us, A, we're telling everyone, hey, the arts matter first and foremost. This is something that continues to be cut out of budgets, cut out of schools, cut out of so many different aspects. And then we're trying to link why the arts matters to our own backgrounds and our experiences, which is, hey, all the skills we learn in the arts uh, translate us to us being great business students, to translate to us being great, you know, getting a job, having a career. And those are the skills that really, really matter. And then um, also making sure that we operate as a strong um, nonprofit, that we've learned everything we took from Warden and actually apply it. I think in terms of the nonprofit sector, what we noticed in the last year or so, there is, it's basically a catch 22. Funders need this, nonprofits give them this, and it's kind of a cycle where um, the impact is not necessarily magnify and maximize to what we think is efficient. So for us, it's a whole year. We've been trying to use everything we learned from Warden, all our professors, all the knowledge we, that we continue to tap into and think about how we can create an innovative organization that doesn't fall into any of these traps that nonprofits can very easily fall into and how can we create a sustainable revenue model moving forward. So lots of moving pieces that hopefully are coming together um, too. Yeah, just to, just to add to that really quickly, uh, I was going through, I got like memories, I think from my Instagram story or something, so it's like five years ago, this was, you know, what was happening, and five years ago, I graduated from high school, uh, and my grad cap was, it was, this is so corny, uh, but it was like, uh, do well by doing good, or something, something, something to like that extent, which is sort of like, you know, making money and running like a really efficient, savvy business. Uh, does not have to be mutually exclusive with running a really impactful nonprofit. Uh, and so we do run corporate workshops and we do make sure that we pay our teaching artists really well. And we do make sure that we hold ourselves to the standards of business where we try to have like really clean marketing materials. And we we invest in those things because we think that those things are not mutually exclusive. They can happen together. And in fact, we've come firmly from the business space. like improv and theater was always something that we cared a lot about but if you look at our degrees we both studied finance and management real estate uh right. and so we sort of own that part of ourselves when we go into these spaces while of course being sensitive to the fact that we don't come from the nonprofit landscape and there's a lot that we can learn from it yeah. but here's our if you will competitive advantage yeah yeah so Thinking along those lines, I'm going to ask a very Wharton-esque question. Yeah. So how will you actually measure the success of the Unscripted Project? Yeah, Mira, take it away. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so I think there are a couple different metrics. Um, the key metrics are, of course, our impact measurement, which is, okay, so we're working. So we've worked with 359 students across 10 schools this first academic year, which is super exciting to us um, and definitely much higher than the goals that we had set a year ago uh, and that was really reaffirming to us that this was something that students and young people and teachers were interested in and found valuable um, but the real question is okay but what effect are we having on those 359 students is it sort of like yeah i went to this thing once and it was fine and i don't even remember what we talked about or is it like no uh this improv program that i did really helped me feel more confident um and i realized the connections that it has to my everyday life beyond just this one class. And so 
the way we try to measure that is by surveys. So we do student surveys before and after the workshop series. Um, one of our mentors, actually Angela Duckworth has been mentoring us uh, at Penn and she's been a super helpful resource. Um, some of you might be familiar with her. She studies grit uh, at Character Lab at Penn. Um, but one of the things she mentioned was that the best way to find out how people feel and about their attitudes is just by asking them sort of like a brain scan. And we're not doing brain scans, so we're just asking students. Uh, and so we measure social anxiety. We measure self-reported self-confidence. And then we measure social and emotional self-efficacy. So we do a screener for social anxiety at the beginning and find out how many students who screen positive at the beginning of the workshop series no longer do at the end. Um, we ask students how confident they feel in front of their peers. Uh, and then social emotional self-efficacy has to do with how do I understand my own emotions? And then how does that translate into my interactions and relationships with other people? Uh, and so because in improv, you're adopting new characters and you're uh, in these made up scenarios where you're actually honing a lot of the same skills that you would use in real life. The theory is your social emotional efficacy in real life will improve. And so what we found is that 15% of students who screen positive for social anxiety at the beginning of the workshop series no longer did by the end. Um, across the board, almost all of the students felt more confident and felt a greater sense of community with their peers. Um, and I think it was 65% showed greater social uh, self-efficacy and 58% showed greater emotional self-efficacy. So that was really exciting for us. Um, one of the gaps that we noticed in our impact measurement is the actual communication skills. So those are something, but like that's not an attitude. That's something that we can actually ask students or we can actually see in students and young people. Um, so as we go back in person in the fall, one of our challenges will be to see how communication skills improve through the course of the workshop. Um, and then there are some organizational statistics as well, right? We want to make sure that we have high retention of our teaching artists. So all five of our teaching artists who we worked with this semester want to continue working with us. So that's a huge win for us because it means we're an efficient nonprofit where the people enjoy working there and probably the quality of work will improve as a result. Um, funding is also a big one. Are we able to continue to raise funds in a way that allows us to be sustainable? Um, so there's been demand for our workshops, our corporate workshops, as well as our free in-school workshops, which is reaffirming. And we also have gotten enough grants and enough supplemental funding, funding to run for another additional school year, which is exciting for us because we know we're building the path to sustainability. So there's definitely a lot of room for improvement and things that we're still tinkering with and honing in on, especially as we transition to in-person, but this is sort of how we've been thinking about it so far. Excellent, excellent. Lot, lots of great stuff going on. Um, so, and I wanna say thank you for the questions that are coming in. Please keep putting questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them in a few minutes. Um, so you're both Wharton grads, as we mentioned, and I'm wondering, because you, you do have, you know, uh, degrees in finance, et cetera, what are your career aspirations beyond Unscripted? I mean, is this going to be front and center where you're applying all your skills, or do you hope to kind of get into real estate and get into these other areas that you you studied at Wharton? You can yeah. both answer this one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think um, our priority at the moment is making sure Unscripted is off the ground, but um, absolutely for us, it's all about continuous learning. We're at a stage where we can hand off a lot of our day to days. Hence, we hired a program director recently to help us with that. But absolutely, I think definitely my professional interest, if you would say, still lies in somewhere between what I studied. Studied both finance and real estate and also cinema studies. So somewhere in between those two vastly different places is definitely um, somewhat of a professional aspiration. But I think the joy of starting on Scripted, even um, straight out of school, is that this is such a meaningful piece with us that we'll, take, that we'll take with us for the rest of our lives. And I think we were, I don't know, we were the, we were the college students who were always like, we can't, be, we can't be trapped with golden handcuffs coming out of school. So I think starting unscripted really puts us in a mentality to really think about the impact we want to generate in our life and the impact we can create even as young people. So making sure that's always top of mind um, as well. Yeah, Mira? Yeah, for me, um, so I'll be 
transitioning into management consulting, which is a different world, uh, after we've transitioned on our full-time program director. Um, so what it looks like is that Philip and I, we've built out a board. So Philip and I are on the board and we have three additional board members who each bring a different area of expertise to the organization. We have a full-time program director and then we have our teaching artist. So between all of us, uh, we're confident that we're going to be able to continue running this program as it is um, and growing it. Um, personally, I will say that I have learned, again, just such an immense amount this year. Um, and the reason that I'm making this transition is because I think there is more to learn in terms of actual applications from my business education to the real world. Um, so that is sort of my motivation for going into that field. Uh, I think Unscripted is going to be a part of my life, honestly, forever. Um, and the idea is if Philip and I can continue to invest in our own professional interests, um, that will also translate to the organization. Great. All right, well, why don't we turn to a couple of the questions since they're coming in. Yeah. Um, I know I'm going to go right back to the beginning. What was your favorite grade to work with? I know you alluded to this, Mira. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so to be clear, Philip and I don't do, don't lead a ton of these in school workshops. Um, but personally, I love middle schools. Uh, I think it, I think we can all relate to it. Like it is a tough time. Um, everyone is so awkward. Uh, and there's just like so much happening that I think when we work with middle schoolers, there's a sort of like, freedom that we're able to create where students are perhaps a little bit self-critical of themselves and you know more open to each other and the pressure is lifted a little bit because i really don't think there should be so much pressure when we're yeah. um i would say i love middle schoolers but i would say my favorite class that we've seen was um was a actually 11th 12th grade music class that we worked with um something about um you know being 11th grade and 12th grade, you kind of like feel like you know yourself, you kind of feel like you know your place, you might be too cool for school to some extent, um, but I feel like we saw those kids um, with those walls that they had built up come down and that was really exciting to us because we we're really about preparing them for college and beyond. So getting to say, oh, I feel more comfortable, I feel like I'm taking risks for the first time, these are super important things that we want to make sure they get before they leave high school. So. Um, that's what I saw was really beneficial. Okay, let's take another question. How did your time at Penn and specifically at Wharton help you grow your business? Oh, immensely. Um, I think I think I became a lot stronger of a presenter and a communicator uh, at Wharton. Every single Wharton class will have some sort of presentation component where you're really challenged to distill what you've learned in a way that uh, you're able to communicate it to others and in a persuasive way. Um, and so the, I think that was just one very clear aspect of, okay, we are constantly pitching what we do, whether it's to funders or to schools, um, to principals and to students. And I think that really honed my skills um, of pitching. Uh, yeah. And I would say um, Penn education is actually quite interdisciplinary um, in terms of the variety of experiences you get to have. Um, me and Mira really were passionate about um, the Philadelphia public schools because we both have experience working in them. Um, I was a tutor with the West Philly Tutoring Project and Mira was to, um, teaching financial literacy in these schools. Um, these are all opportunities that not necessarily Penn but the student clubs involved with Penn are involved with. And also, um, also Mira was taking theater arts classes and I was taking cinema studies classes and those artistic and more um, humanity subjects allowed us to also combine um, all the different things that make unscripted what it is, business, the arts, education. Yeah. Great. Um, so were there any challenges you encountered fundraising wise and how did you overcome them? Oh, many, Philip. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, so much of the last year was proving ourselves and proving that we as young people could create a nonprofit um, that A, makes impact and B, um, is built for the long run. Um, so the challenge of the fundraising I meant, as anyone can imagine, trying to fundraise for $100,000 every single year um, is kind of the baseline of where we want to be. Uh, we learned a lot. That was the one piece that we learned the most. Um, after our time at Penn Warden, which is the whole philanthropy piece of what we do. 
So building relationships with foundations, the process takes a very long time, um, establishing relationship with donors, um, and kind of embracing how awkward fundraising is was the biggest lesson for us. We're like, oh, how do people do it? We don't have, it feels so awkward. Um, but we learned that, you know, it, it, this is an awkward process, even for the best fundraisers out there. Um, and really to embrace that, you know, this is such an important piece about our sustainability um, and really focusing on how we can be smart about it moving forward. And then simultaneously, we are using our ward and education to some extent to help us by creating revenue streams. Um, those aspects of what we do, um, strings that allow us to bring our own money in is less awkward for us. Um, it's kind of our comfort zone, I guess. So that's always there uh, as a little bit of a safety net for us as well. But yeah, we're getting there slowly and surely. <laughs> Yeah, you've done a lot in a year. I mean, <laughs> you give yourself a break. You know, it's one foot in front of the other these days. Um, it's amazing, actually, how much you've been able to accomplish since uh, winning the prize. How else did you get to explore your passions for improv at Penn? Like, a little bit more detail about your your theater experience. Yeah, my um my favorite show. So I was actually pretty involved with the theater arts program at Penn. So the, I took a lot of classes or I did a lot of shows where uh, it was sort of attached to a class. So my favorite show that I did was called Government Inspector um, and I did it right before COVID. So we I think we opened like very close to Valentine's Day. So that's like middle of February. And then one month later it was spring break and everything was closed seemingly forever, not forever, obviously, but, um, and so that was a really cool experience because uh, I felt like a lot of the actors had a lot of agency in sort of shaping this production. Um, and so the show is basically, it's kind of like a political satire, uh, which also was like very interesting to do because it was, a, yeah, it was just like a very interesting uh, production to do. And there were a lot of opportunities for us to inform the character. So I wouldn't say that's actually like an improv experience uh, altogether, but there were many moments where I felt like I was able to shape my character based on what I was seeing and what I was getting from the other characters, what I was getting from the plot um, and sort of things as they were building. Um, there are some really cool improv comedy groups at Penn. I don't think Philip and I were as active in them, um, but uh, Without a Net is sort of the main group that does improv sketches and shows. Uh, and they were actually kind enough to submit a sketch for us, a couple of sketches for us um, that we showed in one of our virtual gala fundraisers. Um, so work tight with them and they're super funny and a very close knit group. So those avenues definitely do exist at Pod. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. Um, only thing I'll add on is, yeah, I was also more involved in the production side at Penn, so definitely did a few plays, Front Row Theatre Company, and cultural shows with the various cultural groups on campus. But so many opportunities to be involved in performing arts at Penn. Um, such a vibrant and really supportive community. So I feel like I'd be remiss not to ask you about this Angela Duckworth connection, <laughs> at least maybe to talk about sort of the role that grit has played for you. I mean, I know that's not all she does, but she's so affiliated and associated with that word. So, you know, when you think about kind of your entrepreneurial journey, um, what has it meant for you to understand just that that sheer determination and being able to really stick with it? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Bill. No, I'm thinking. Um, I think yeah, I think um, more than anything, um, you have to believe in yourself first to achieve what you want to achieve. I think that was a really important thing for us um, that, you know, I think in the beginning, we, this is something that you develop over time as well. Um, in the beginning, even after winning the prize, we we're like, wow, this is a huge task we're about to take on. And, you know, we did lots of planning, but there are so many things that you cannot plan for. Right. Um, like, wow. Like, oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Philip, you took accounting classes, right? You're doing all that bookkeeping or Mira, <laughs> you read how to start up um, like all the legal things to do with a nonprofit. So I think it's um, a trust in your own abilities and um, ability. And then also knowing that when you need help, you should ask for it. And all of that comes from really knowing yourself. 
and have been determined for the whatever outcome you're trying to achieve and getting there with all the support that you have um, and all the belief you have in yourself. I think that's been really, really important to us. Um, yeah, otherwise, there's many times where we could have just definitely hit a little bit, but I think being taking those risks and being vulnerable has been Right, because you guys now are hearing about all of our successes, but that's not to say that we haven't had many, many failures or many, many rejections, uh, because we have, right? Like we've gotten rejected from a ton of foundations who have said, this is way too early, we need to see three years. And our question is, well, you know, like, how do we get to three years without your funding? We're figuring it out because now we're in a good spot. Um, but it, there's so many, like, there will be classroom teachers who say, you know, like, I get this, I think it's important. However, um, I can't justify not teaching my normal English lesson and instead doing improv every week for 10 weeks. So you get a lot of rejection. And I think a big piece of it is, and this was really hard for me uh, personally, is just not taking it personally and continuing, like Philip said, to believe in yourself and forge ahead. Um, obviously, that means, of course, listening to feedback back and adjusting where you think things are necessary. But if the central premise of what you're doing is questioned, um, as it will be, uh, just having the resolve to like believe in it and stick it through. Yeah, very good. And very much about improv too, right? It's that lesson carrying over. So Anika has a question. In the future, how do you think your venture will evolve and change? Which is actually something I was going to also ask. <laughs> but you know, you've talked a little bit about what's next for the unscripted project. But um, I'd love to see you know a longer term vision and how do you think it might evolve? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, in terms of the short term, the most obvious um, evolution for us is hopefully returning to in person instruction. Um, I think the benefits and the joy of improv will only magnify when we can do it all in person together. Um, so that's the first evolution for us. And then, in terms of the other aspects of the organization, the next three years, We'll say um, in kind of our organizational plan is to make sure we have the right infrastructure in place, but investing in the right places for uh, eventual growth in the future. And hopefully we can replicate what we do in other cities across the country. Um, in terms of our long term vision, I think it is definitely try to aim as high as we can. For us, it's about not only helping the students we serve, but collecting the data um, and advocating for why does this not exist in schools in the first place. So really making sure that we can be a program that is run not only effectively, but collects the right message so that we can one day lobby or present and be like, hey, there is a clear statistically significant reason why the arts matter. That's definitely the grand vision of what we're trying to accomplish. I'm curious too about your relationship, the two of you. So you have known each other so long at this point, meeting freshman year, um, and has has it challenged at all the strength of your relationship, or has it strengthened the collaboration? I'm just curious how how it's been because you're making all these really serious and significant decisions together, building out something together. And I'd love to know what impact that's had on you both individually. Yeah, so we, I think the the joke is that like we've been to all of, not a joke, we've been to all of each other's birthday parties. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing because now we're 22, 23 and we started when we were like 17, 18. Um, but uh, I think that we got closer as the years went by. It was actually our junior year um, that we started sort of brainstorming specifically, uh, what are we going to do? We, uh, One of our friends actually won the President's Engagement Prize a couple of years prior, and that's when it sort of was brought into the realm of like something that could potentially happen uh, that was within reach. And so, and then we also did like a lot of finance projects together. Uh, and we all, like, we also just like had a lot of the same friends. Um, so we always had spent a lot of time together, but it's been like next level this year. I think Philip is the single person that I speak to the most in my entire life, like like more than anybody and by a significant margin. Um, in quarantine, we were in the same pod. Uh, so we would see each other and spend time with each other. And honestly, like it was really nice to have someone who like we have our disagreements in business all the time. I think uh, we have different perspectives on things and um, we sort of allocate like 
you know, I know Philip is better than me at design. And so I sort of just defer to him on design decisions. Um, and I could say the same vice versa for him on a couple of other things, but we do disagree on things. And so knowing that like, regardless of whether we disagree on things business wise, like the next day, like we'll go to a birthday dinner together. So like knowing that that friendship still exists and is that bedrock is actually really reassuring and reaffirming because then I know like I can tell Philip I disagree with him and he's not going to take it so personally and see that as like, oh, Mira doesn't respect me or anything. He knows that bedrock exists, hopefully. Uh, and so I think it's just made our relationship a lot stronger. And we still hang out like it's kind of ridiculous because like we do spend so much time together, but we'll also like hang out and explore Philly together. Uh, on yeah. top of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that's also the reason why we decided to team up for this project. It's also we knew we had very uh, complementary skill sets. Um, there's like a saying, you know, don't get into business with your friends or your family. But in this case, since we're interested in very different things um, and also are good at very different things, together we actually form um, quite a strong partnership um, just purely based on where our interests lie. And we kind of knew that and we play that to our strength. Yeah. And like all of the group projects at Wharton were sort of test runs for it, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little did you know you were preparing for such greatness. <laughs> um, so this is interesting. Uh, Philip, I think I'm going to toss this one at you since you were talking about the funding. Um, the question is, what do you think made them invest in you and what negotiating skills did you use? So this is definitely a Wharton-esque type of question as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, when you talk about venture pitches, whether it's for a nonprofit or for your startup idea, I think the reason why people invest is always for the people and not necessarily the product. I think first and foremost is the belief that this team can achieve something, um, whether it's this thing they're pitching you or it's something else in the future. So I think that was basically our last question, but I think me and Mira knew we were very complementary in our skill sets and we made sure that um, when we presented our ideas or how on how we're going to run this, it was very clear what our roles were and what our strengths were and also what our weaknesses were. So that was first and foremost. And um, I think, yeah, tagging on what I just said, I think a key thing of making a strong pitch is knowing where your weaknesses are. Um, and acknowledging them and figuring out how you're going to fulfill those gaps. I think we are no experts. I mean, we love improv, but we're no experts in improv. And we're no experts in public school education. We're no experts in the community of Philadelphia. So we made sure that we were informed and not only informed, but brought those people onto our team um, to support decisions we were going to make, the curriculum we we're going to create and the people we we're going to work with. So that was really important. And then um, C, I think just having a structurally sound business plan, you know that everything in this plan is probably not gonna go the way you planned it, but at least you thought through the elements and I think that's really important when you're pitching. Great. Yeah, and I that word relationships just comes back to me again. I mean, we talked about your relationship together, but it sounds like you've had to build a lot of significant relationships to ensure success yeah. for what you've been doing. And I think that's just such an important lesson, you know, for any kind of entrepreneurial endeavor or any kind of business setting is that you have to know mm -hmm. how to do that. Um, okay, so we'll do one more student question and then I have one more and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so if you were to start over from ground zero, what would you do differently? That's kind of a big one to toss at you toward the end, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we did a good job um, laying the foundational stuff pretty early on. So getting a website out, getting legally incorporated, getting our tax exam status right off the bat was really important. I think we probably actually though could have started sooner um, in terms of what is what are our revenue generators. Um, we had a month in March where we were like, OK, we're just going to try a bunch of different ideas and whichever one sticks, we'll commit to in April. So we tried. Uh, yeah, We just tried a, like a bunch of different things. We tried um, packaging it in different ways, selling our workshop to different audiences. Um, and we were really surprised, actually, by how quickly the improv for teams offering took off. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think looking back, 
it, it makes sense because it was something that really played to our advantages as a team and as an organization. And we didn't necessarily need to wait so long to start doing that. Um, I, I think we were sort of caught in this balance of like, what is it like as a nonprofit, we have to be doing these things. And this is sort of like, oh, like an additional thing. But now in June, we realize, no, it's not an additional thing. It's actually a core part of our business model. Um, and so just trusting our instinct on that uh, yeah. and knowing that this is something that, no, we actually could do well uh, was something that we could have done sooner uh, and with more certainty. So, I mean, I don't regret having that period where we tried a bunch of different things. But now I look back and I'm like, I'm not shocked that this is what this is what worked and we could have done it sooner. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say I wouldn't do anything differently. But what we need to work on moving forward, as Mira says, is to continue, um, as I mentioned before, um, trusting yourself and having that self-belief is something you work on over time. And I think for us, um, we come from, I think we approach it from a very humble lens in the sense that we're not experts in any of these things. We're not experts at all. So um, we'll definitely listen um, first and then react after. Um, and then we realize that now we're in a position where we can probably can react first um, and actually trust that instincts because sometimes the feedback loop takes so long. By the time we hear what we need to hear, it's been a couple of months. Um, and that really slows down our progress and it only is a disservice to the students we serve. So um, being confident and trusting ourselves and knowing it's going to work out. Um, also, yeah, just listening to the little voice that tells you, that guides you, I think is really important and not doubting yourself. Yeah. Right. Intuition. Mm -hmm. All right, well, my last question for you is, since we don't all have access to the great unscripted resources, how can we incorporate improv into our own lives and become stronger through all of the great aspects of improv? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my first my first thing is actually, uh, here's a quick plug. Uh, we'll be running unscripted improv workshops in the gym uh, next week and the week after on Wednesdays. So I'm sure Diana and Allison will send out a link for that. Highly recommend you come. I would love to see the faces of the folks who asked the questions and have been listening to us pontificate for a while. Um, and it's just like a very intro, low stakes way to run improv games and exercises and sort of capture this feeling that we've been talking about. But if you're not able to make it, uh, I would really recommend sort of anything that sort of pushes you outside of your comfort zone. Uh, I would challenge you to try an activity where you know like you're going to be the worst at it and then just see it as a learning opportunity because then the permission structure for mistakes has already been created. Um, and approaching that with like a source of humility uh, so it could literally be anything like it could be a coding class where you're like, I don't know how to code, but I'm just going to try it. And because I know that, like, I don't need to excel in this, you're able to make mistakes and you're able to sort of capture similar feelings. Um, there are improv classes and theater classes that you can take um, no matter where you guys go to school. Like, I would encourage you to explore any sort of thing where you're getting in front of people and have to present something. Uh, I think there's nothing quite like that feeling either. Yeah, the last thing I'll add to that is that if you just Google like easy, low stakes improv games on the internet, there's so many you can play with your family and um, friends right now. Uh, there's always YouTube tutorials and they're always so easy. Um, you don't need anything. You just need your bodies and like four people or two people. Um, and just Google it as well. Yeah. Great advice. I might be, I'm going to give it a try personally. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Mira and Philip, it's been really wonderful talking to you both today, and I've loved learning about the Unscripted Project. I wish you the best of luck with it. And Thank thanks you. all of you for tuning in. Join us for our next Wharton Alumni Career Chat at noon on Thursday, June 24th, when Eli Lesser will be interviewing Diego Gigliani, Managing Director at City Football Club. See you all next time. Diana. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.